for that kind introduction, and thanks so much for the invitation to come here. It's been a wonderful experience for me to be here and to learn so much from the talks that I've heard so far, and to meet some of you, and I look forward to that more. Um, and, uh, and it's just, just, a, just a terrific thing. So um, I hope that what I have to offer today has something to offer you, um, you know, uh, in terms of the research that I'm doing, which I'm realizing as I hear so many interesting talks is, is fairly different from a lot of the work that's going on within this group, at least that I've heard about so far. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about singing and talking about a particular characteristic of singing, referred to as pitch accuracy, which I'll sometimes slip into the shorthand of calling singing accuracy, which is some uh, something that I've been very interested in for the past decade or so, really longer in a broader sense, and addressing three questions related to pitch accuracy that I hope will bring a sort of a big picture perspective to things. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about my background, not my bio per se, but um, my own sort of scientific perspective that I bring to this research, which is that um, I am a cognitive psychologist. As Robert said, I'm in the psychology department at SUNY Buffalo. Because of that, my primary interest in this research is to try and understand um, a characteristic of how the mind works. In my lab, we focus a lot on the interplay between perception and action as it exists in music performance, including but not limited to singing, and sometimes beyond music performance. I'm also interested in singing in general across the population, as opposed to elite level singers or people with a vocal disorder. Um, I'm interested in um, singing as a behavior that we all engage in. Some of us may be able to engage in this behavior more effectively than others, um, but uh, that's where I'm coming from. And often I'm very interested in people who don't do so well. I find them, in some ways, for me, more interesting than people who are really good at singing, quote unquote. Um, so let's start off. First off, talk about what I mean by pitch accuracy. Um, and along with that, why focus on pitch accuracy at all? There are many ways in which singing may be considered accurate or inaccurate. I focus on pitch in part because it's a big concern for um, music teachers, it's a big concern for people in the world. When I talk to people about the research I do and I tell them that I study inaccurate or poor pitch singing, they almost inevitably volunteer for my studies. People are very quick to denigrate their own pitch accuracy in singing. And, uh, and you see it in movies too, like this famous scene from Citizen Kane, where the vocal instructor is trying to teach Kane's uh, new bride to be an opera singer, and she's obviously not quite up to the task, and he gets very frustrated because he doesn't really know what to do. And I think when it comes to pitch accuracy, uh, we're getting there, but I think we, there's a ways to go before we really understand what to do with the child or with the adult who is not able to match a pitch with their voice. From a psychology perspective, I think that um, pitch accuracy of singing is a fascinating and really incredible kind of imitative behavior that we engage in. Because when we're singing, we're usually trying to imitate, if not an exact recording, the kind of abstract structure of the piece of music. And if you think about other forms of imitation, like golf, for instance, singing is, in a sense, a lot easy, a lot harder to do than golfing. So golfing is very frustrating, especially if you're someone like Adam Sandler. Um, and, but when you're learning to golf, you can watch the actions that the expert is engaging in. You can even, to some degree, observe your own actions and compare them visually. And um, as was discussed um, earlier this morning, um, we don't see anything that goes on when we're singing, uh, by and large, unless you have uh, very you know, fancy equipment on hand. Um, and also, um, the, when we're singing, we're not moving limbs around in that very overt way that we might do while we're golfing. So in a sense, it's amazing that anyone can do this correctly. So, getting more into what I mean by pitch accuracy in singing, let's address the issue of measurement. And here I'm going to introduce a relatively new standardized measure of singing accuracy, pitch accuracy, that I developed with Steve Demarest in consultation with a, a team of people in uh, music education, psychology, and neuroscience who all were interested in singing accuracy. We call it the Seattle Singing Accuracy Protocol. 
uh, was designed at a workshop in Seattle, hence the name. It's available online to the general public. Uh, we're working on version two. Version one can be a bit clunky depending on your internet connection, but it does work well enough for us to get a sizable sample. And what this protocol does is it provides for the user what this team decided would be a minimal set of tasks necessary in order to um, in order to understand, in order to measure singing accuracy and easily related correlates. And you can see it there. I think this is the, the uh, um, laser pointer here. Now, within this measure, there's one portion of it that I really want to focus on the most, and which is our most critical way of assessing pitch accuracy. And this is the portion that involves pitch imitation tasks, um, varying in terms of the number of pitches you imitate, single or four note, and vocal timbre or piano timbre. And this task is set up in a call and response kind of framework, where you first hear a target pitch or a target pitch pattern and listen to it, and immediately afterwards imitate it. So here's an example of one of the pattern pitches we have. And you then imitate it afterwards. By the way, that was a human singer, but we you know, found ideal notes and spliced them together, so it gives it a little bit of a robotic quality. But anyway, some people imitate these patterns very accurately. And then, of course, because we're interested in the gamut of singing abilities, we also have people who don't imitate particularly accurately. Da, 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 da. So there's an example of someone who would be classified as an inaccurate or poor pitch singer. Now, to date, we've collected a fair bit of data using this um, uh, measure, and I'll report uh, some uh, parts of that data today. And uh, so we have a sample that I'll talk about in a bit of uh, 1,058 people. Uh, 632 took it online in the comfort of their own home. We listened to all of them to make sure they weren't just joking. Uh, 426 were in my lab and uh, taking part in screening procedures that we use. Uh, we have a wide range of ages, particularly from the general public sample, 6 to 99 years old, and a wide range of musical training, 0 to 50 years, um, most of which is not vocal training, but I can talk more about that later. Uh, so, what, so given the sample, how do we measure all these people? Well, part of the answer is that the SAP has an automated set of procedures for analyzing pitch accuracy for the imitative tasks. And here's a bit how that works. It's, it's nowhere near the intricacy of measuring vocal fold vibrations, but it's what we've got. Um, so here's an example of a recording. So we have a digital audio file of someone singing one of these pitch patterns or imitating a single pitch. Here's what this one sounds like. Do, 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 do. So this is one of these cute little kids who took the measure. Uh, we take this and we extract the fundamental frequency using the MATLAB program YIN, and that gives us a pitch trace for the target, which is here shown in blue, and the imitation, which is here shown as red. So the squiggly lines are the extracted fundamental frequency information from this recording. Now, the target has boundaries of plus or minus 50 cents around it because these are the boundaries we use to define an error versus a correctly sung note. Now, from these, um, this fundamental frequency information, we if extract information about where the note onsets are using fluctuations in the amplitude contour. Because people are singing on the syllable do, uh, that stop consonant uh, gives us a little burst of intensity at the beginning of each note that we can use to identify where notes begin without having to go in and manually mark each of the 1,058 uh, participant recordings. Um, and so we take the median of the central portion of each note, and that gives us this kind of flat line representation of the notes in a performance. So the imitations and the targets. So these flat lines are directly extracted from this recording here. <laughs> there are many ways you can analyze what you might call pitch accuracy. I'm going to focus on two, which we use most often. Uh, one is to look at the absolute deviation between the sung and target pitches in the metric known as cents, which was talked about earlier today. 100 cents is one semitone. Uh, and that's a mean absolute deviation measure. We also measure these as errors, and that involves categorizing each sung pitch in a dichotomous way as being error or correct. And we use the boundary of plus or minus 50 cents to um, designate error versus correct because, of course, if you're more than 50 cents away, you're closer to uh, the adjacent pitch in the tuning system than you are to the target pitch. So for this performance here, 
this is what would result. We have a deviation for the first sum pitch of 41 cents. Not perfect, but not quite what we call an error. Note two, we call an error. There's a 78 cent deviation. Note three, we would also call an error with a 61 cent deviation. Note four, she really rocked that one. Uh, she only had a 13 cent deviation for that one. So depending on the measure you use, you would refer to this particular performance as having a mean deviation of 48 cents or having a 50% error rate. So this is how we're measuring pitch accuracy in the SAP. So pitch accuracy basically it reflects the proximity of some pitches to target pitches in these kinds of imitative procedures. Now, using these kinds of measures and using this large sample, we can address what I think is an interesting and important question about pitch accuracy in the general population. Namely, is the ability to sing accurately, like I think most people believe, a rare gift that only a few elite people have, or is it a common trait? And I think it's worth asking that, because even though many people think they can't sing, we generally sing from the point at which we're babies, pretty consistently through childhood, maybe taking a break here and there, but we continue singing now and then through adulthood. So it is a regular human behavior. So let's look at um, statistics from this sample that I have on hand. So this is a histogram. Uh, plotting for each participant the percent of pitches categorized as correct um, across all of the imitation tasks in the set. Um, and the number of participants is the y-axis. The bins here are pretty fine grain. Each bin contains 2.5% range of accuracy. And what we see here is that the modal tendency in this group is clearly toward what we call accurate singing. The highest bin, 97.5% correct, up to 100% correct, is by far the most frequent score. And if we set a few boundaries, uh, for instance, between 80% and 100% correct, over half of our sample is falling in that fairly high. So the way I grade exams, this would mean a B grade or higher uh, of singing. Uh, if we make it a little stricter to 90% correct, we have still over a third of the sample. And if we make it more uh, stringent still, up to 95%, we have 23%. So from data like these data, I would say that accurate singing is the dominant tendency in the general population, although there's also clearly a lot of variability. This is a highly skewed distribution with a big long tail going all the way down to 0% correct. Um, one problem with this percent correct measure, though, is it's not exactly transparent how to interpret these different boundaries. What does it mean to be 80% correct in terms of how close you are to the target pitches? So the sense deviation measure is a bit better on that score. So let's look at a histogram of the mean absolute pitch deviation in sense. Now here, low scores are better because it's a deviation score. Again, we see the dominant tendency toward what we would want to call more accurate singing. Um, if we set the boundary at 200 cents, which is a whole tone away on average within that boundary, we find 77%, over three quarters of our, our, our sample is singing within a whole tone on average. Uh, within 100 cents, we have over half. And if we look at 50 cents, which is the most common measure you see in the literature on singing accuracy to define good versus bad, so to speak, uh, it's still over a quarter. So again, the dominant tendency is toward accurate singing. Accurate singing may not be a rare gift. Accurate singing may be a common trait, but there is clearly large individual differences. There's clearly a lot to work with here. So to wrap up this section of the talk, uh, what I would mean by pitch accuracy in singing is this kind of proximity and pitch matching. There are lots of other ways to measure pitch accuracy in singing. This way, I find straightforward to do. Uh, I find easy to measure, so in my own kind of cognitive psychology way, I find it handy. But there are a lot of other ways we could measure it. I could actually probably give a second talk about that, but I, I chose not to. Um, and as far as there are some additional considerations um, that I'll talk about later, um, one thing that this part of the talk didn't get into at all is what do these deviations mean for the listener? Right? So that's come up in this uh, symposium too, right? Do listeners care about these deviations and at what point do listeners care? I'll address that in the third part of the talk. But for now, I want to get into the section of the talk which is the most kind of theoretically oriented, which has to do with the question of where does um, pitch accuracy 
come from? Right, so what are the basic mechanisms driving it? And, uh, and actually, Charles Larson sort of scooped me on this one because what I'm about to show is almost identical to one of your slides in your, in your talk yesterday, and this has to do with this uh, sensory motor vocal loop, uh, which I am drawing directly from work by Berkowska and Dalabella, who proposed this with respect to singing, but again, it's, it's very closely related to what uh, Charles was showing yesterday. And so this outlines three basic functions that have to work right in order for singing pitch matching to occur. Uh, and this, this is a very simplified, very schematic picture of the basic mechanisms. And basically, we have to have a properly functioning ability to perceive pitch from external input or from oneself. Um, we have to have the ability to assemble and produce a motor plan for uh, pitch involving all the kinds of things we've been talking about a lot at the symposium. And then my personal favorite is this third bit, which involves translating our perceptual experiences into a motor plan. And this involves this inverse modeling uh, that, uh, that has come up before in this symposium. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the functioning of these three components. Before getting into each component on its own, though, let's address an important question about this whole framework and where it might come from. All right? So along with my sense in talking to people, that people generally think that singing accuracy is a rare gift. I also get the sense from talking to people uh, that people in general believe uh, that um, singing accuracy, pitch accuracy, is something that you are born with. That it's, it's a talent or a gift rather than a learned skill. Uh, as someone who used to have people ask not to sing and got better at it, I take some exception to that. And I think we have data to suggest that you should take exception to that. So is pitch accuracy in an innate gift or a learned skill. So in a study I did with Steve Demarest and Brian Nichols, uh, both of whom are in music education, we looked longitudinally at children in kindergarten at the beginning and the end of the year. So kindergarten is a really pivotal year. A lot of developmental changes happening then. It's a really right age to look at for developmental changes. And so we had different groups of kindergartners have different amounts of training in singing. So one group of kindergartners got daily Kodai training in singing, another group got uh, no singing training, and then a third group got singing training each week. And what we found was a significant effect of how much training kindergartners got from the beginning to the end of the year. So the children who got no training did improve, right? This is an improvement measure, by the way. This is difference pre to post in the number of accurately, or percent of accurately imitated pitches on tasks like the SAP, but not the SAP explicitly. The group that had weekly instruction, a little better, but not significantly so, but then significantly better improvement for those who got daily instruction. So singing instruction does work at this age, and that's a good thing, isn't it? But there's some bad news to go along with this, right? So if you think about um, music training, at least in most U.S. school systems, you get regular musical instruction up to middle school, and then everybody goes their own way. And if you want to go down the music path, you go down that path. If you want to go down the football path, you go down that path. It's usually hard to go down two paths at once, the way schools are these days. Uh, and so some people quit. And so let's, think, let's look more broadly at change uh, across school years and into young adulthood. And so we did this in a companion study that I did with also Seth and Louis. Um, we looked cross-sectionally. Uh, here are our kindergartners, pre-training, so this is the same sample here, their accuracy. A second group of kids who are in sixth grade, there is a lot of improvement from kindergarten to sixth grade. This is about the last year that many kids have regular school instruction. So let's look now at college students that I collected who by and large did not have musical training. So these were primarily um, individuals who decided to go down the non-music path. And well, that's a bummer, right? They almost go all the way back down to the kindergartners. Now, this is, of course, a cross-sectional study. Uh, this would be hard to do longitudinally, but I think it's worth doing, because it very strongly suggests that singing pitch accuracy is a learned motor behavior, but it also may be a kind of a use it or lose it behavior. Of course, intermingled with this are things like changes in puberty that the boys have to negotiate, and to a lesser degree that girls have to negotiate. But in any case, these uh, you know continued experience is probably important. Now, these are kind of smaller sample studies, and uh, it is hard to pick apart the interplay between age and experience in these small samples. But we can do that using our SAP database, 
So this is the 632 people who took the SAP as part of the general public. And we can look more broadly at the role of age and the role of musical experience. Uh, here is the relationship between age in years and percent correct pitch matching. The best fit was this nonlinear quadratic fit, which has best accuracy in the kind of young adult to middle adult years, and then tapering off at each extreme. But I should note, accounting for a very small portion of the variance. It's a significant fit, but 4%, who's going to get excited about that? When we look at training, it's, uh, it's still a small amount of variance, but it's uh, more than twice the amount of 4%. Uh, and here's the relationship between years of musical training. A lot of people piling up around zero, which is a kind of a measurement issue. Uh, Spearman's row produces a similar um, correlation as Pearson's, by the way. Now, one thing to note is you, in multiple regression analyses, can separate age and musical training from each other, and they bo both do contribute uh, distinctly from each other. And if you put them both into a multiple regression model, we're accounting for just shy of 20% of the overall variability. So we're getting up there. There's still a lot of variability left unaccounted for. So let's now turn back to this sensory motor vocal loop and talk about the different components that arguably have to function right for pitch accuracy to work correctly. So let's start with perception. After all, what do we often call people who can't sing, as, as they say, or don't sing well? We often call them tone deaf. Uh, now, people generally don't mean, I can't hear pitch, but we can use that as a kind of a starting hypothesis. After all, if you can't hear differences between pitches, it's probably, it should be difficult for you to produce pitches accurately. And so I've done this, and others have, in various studies, looking at the relationship between your ability to discriminate pitches, how close together pitches can be for you to tell that they differ from each other, and singing accuracy. So many studies out there do actually report no relationships uh, between these two measures, but with smaller sample, samples. In our SAP database, we have a larger sample, and we do find that there is a significant correlation between your pitch discrimination threshold, by the way, low values are good, high values are bad, and the percent correct pitch match. Again, not accounting for a huge amount of variability, but statistically significant. The variance you account for in singing accuracy jumps way up relative to this, this, excuse me, if you look at your ability to discriminate pitches in a more musical context. So in a later study, uh, my former student Nicholas Nolan and I looked at the relationship between pitch accuracy on the SAP and people's performance on a measure known as the Montreal Battery of the Evaluation of Amusia, which involves the ability to discriminate where pitches are out of place in a melody. And here, we account for 30% uh, of the variance in singing accuracy, or 30% of the variance between these two variables is shared, I should say. So when we have this more complex, more musically relevant task, which involves tonal encoding, uh, we uh, have a lot more, a lot stronger of a relationship there. So pitch perception uh, definitely plays some role. Uh, not a gigantic role, but it is playing a role in singing accuracy. Now next I'm going to get to the part of the talk, which at this point, having been here for a day and a half, honestly feels a little bit embarrassing, because I'm going to talk about motor control next. And this group is so fantastic at measuring motor control of pitch and vocal physiology in ways that in my lab we haven't gotten to. So I have lots of ideas about how to do better what's on the next slide. But in any case, here's how we have addressed the relationship between singing accuracy and vocal motor control. And now to me, in this, in this case, it's very important to separate vocal motor control of pitch that is done in a way that is matching a target, so you know, a sort of imitative or pitch matching use of the vocal system, as opposed to the ability to control the vocal motor system outside of this imitative context. I think the latter is much more important for establishing vocal motor control as a separate source of singing pitch accuracy. Now, Sean Hutchins and Isabel Pretz did a great study addressing just that issue by removing the vocal motor system from pitch matching. And they did that by having participants match pitch with their voice or with a slider. And they compared the performance of musicians and non-musicians. Non-musicians are generally poorer at matching pitch than musicians are. And when they did the pitch matching task with a slider, the groups were pretty much identical to each other after a little practice. 
Whereas with the voice, there was a sizable difference in uh, pitch matching accuracy between the groups. So we can say from data like this that um, pitch accuracy may be a product that is restricted to the vocal motor system. That is to say, a poor pitch singer might not necessarily have a general disability in imitating pitch or general problem, but it might be something specific to the vocal system. Well, going further with this, can we say that inaccurate singers have trouble controlling pitch with their voice or a restriction of range in their voice outside the context of imitation? The data I've collected so far suggests the answer is no. So for instance, when we've had singers classified as inaccurate or, or accurate sustain a pitch without vibrato and look at how level their pitches are by using the standard deviation of the fundamental frequency, we do not find a difference across these groups. Also, when we've had people come into the lab and generate vocal sweeps going as high or as low as they can comfortably do so with their voice, we do not find a relationship between the size of the vocal sweep and the percent of correctly matched pitches. Now, as I said before, I now, thanks to all of you, know about a lot of other measures that I'm inclined to use, so this has got to be tentative. But so far, it seems that, that um, singing pitch accuracy may be a feature of the vocal motor system um, and it might be specific, uh, a form of imitation that's specific to that system, but deficits in that system may not be only due to vocal motor control, maybe. Um, which leads me to the third component of the system, as I say, my personal favorite, uh, from a cognitive psychology perspective, is one I'm really interested in, and that has to do with sensory motor translation. The ability to take a perceptual representation and convert it into a motor plan. Now, some years ago, I was giving a talk at Bucknell University about the work I was doing on that. And Andrea Halpern, who's a professor there, um, does research on auditory imagery. And her research that she's done along with Robert Zatori uh, has shown that when we generate an auditory image, when we imagine a tune in our heads, uh, the areas of our brain that are engaged in that activity are not just perceptual, but also involve motor planning areas, like the supplementary motor area in particular. Uh, these results suggest that auditory imagery may act as a kind of a primer for motor planning, and therefore, auditory imagery may play a fundamental role in sensory motor translation, and our ability to imagine uh, the song that we are about to sing, or the pitch we are about to match, uh, might be very closely related to pitch accuracy in singing. Uh, so she and I uh, did an initial test of this idea some years ago, where we looked at the relationship between a simple pitch matching task and a measure she constructed known as the Bucknell Auditory Imagery Scale. This is a self-report measure where people are asked to generate an auditory image and then rate, for instance, how vivid that image is. And what we found was a significant association. People who sang more pitches in tune reported more vivid auditory images than those who sang fewer in tune. Uh, statistically significant, but also fairly small amount of variance accounted for. Um, and that is not super surprising when you consider, for instance, that we're relying on a self-report measure, which is going to have a lot of variability across individuals. Also, another issue with using a self-report measure is we know nothing about how accurate their auditory images are. Uh, we only know how vivid they feel the images are. So um, my, another collaborator of mine, Emma Greenspawn, uh, went a step further uh, to look at uh, an active imagery task and also looking at the role of working or short-term memory capacity. Because of course when we are sustaining an auditory image in our heads, we have to sustain it in our short-term memory. And when we're sustaining a four-note melody in our heads, some of us might be able to do that better than others, etc. Uh, and so she found, we found, uh, a significant relationship between an active auditory imagery task called the pitch imagery arrow task and singing accuracy. Here's a schema of the pitch imagery arrow task, which was designed by Rachel Gelding. Uh, in Bill Thompson's lab down in Australia. And basically in this task, you have to generate auditory images based on arrows that determine the direction of a pitch change within a tonal context that is designated by a scale. And so you can judge how accurately people are generating these pitch images. She also looked at um, 
short-term memory span for pitch. How long of a sequence of pitches can people accurately sustain in short-term memory? And this was a task that was designed by Victoria Williamson. We also have a significant correlation there. By the way, these are partial R values, so these are relationships that are significant when you take into account and remove variability from all the other measures, right? So they're not simple bivariate relationships. As you can see, because you're all looking at the slides as I talk, right, she also included verbal measures, a verbal uh, imagery task and a verbal um, memory span task. Neither of these tasks correlated significantly with singing accuracy. So what we have here is what we call a dimensionally specific um, contribution of sensory motor translation to singing accuracy, with sensory motor translation being guided by the formation of an, of an auditory image and the ability to sustain that in your working memory. Now, let's take this idea that auditory imagery generates motor planning itself one step further. So if that's the case, if thinking about a tune leads to motor planning, we should be able to measure some minor level uh, motor activity in the peripheral motor system in response to this. And uh, in fact, you can and we have, so that's the next study, which was done with Andrea Halpern and another one of my collaborators, Tim Pruitt. Uh, so there's this phenomenon that I'm sure many of you know about called subvocalization, which is the engagement of vocal muscles in the absence of vocal production. And subvocalization has been found when people are reading notation and imagining the tune, or when people are reading text. And so what we looked at was whether um, um, there is subvocalization that occurs when people are imagining a melody they're about to sing, and if so, whether this has any relationship with singing actors. So we gave people uh, singing tasks, like the ones I've been telling you about, this new four-note melody, imagine it, sing it back, as well as a control task involving verbal imagery, where we gave people one of these spatial arrays of nonsense objects that they had to retain in their working memory. And uh, during the rehearsal phase, we measured uh, muscle movements using surface electromyography, and we use these following sites. Uh, the most important site for us was the left sternocleoid and the right sternocleoid, although we got better measures from the left, so I'm gonna talk about that. Now, I, I need to mention this because, um, you know, we've been talking about vocal muscles, and this muscle's never come up yet so far today because it does play a rather minor and indirect role in pitch control. Um, the reason why we use this muscle is because we are measuring tiny, tiny signals during auditory imagery. And this muscle has, of course, a very uh, superficial location, and it's easy to find and locate. And with pilot studies, we found that this, this muscle was the best. So we were relying also on the help from um, Kara Steps, careful work, uh, identifying where to measure this muscle movement. And so we did find that there is more uh, sternocheoid activity during auditory imagery than during visual imagery or during a baseline rest condition. So we do have subvocalization during auditory imagery. Um, now, does it have a relationship with singing accuracy? The answer is yes. Although it wasn't exactly the relationship we were expecting at first, it is positively correlated with error rates. So the more subvocalization, the higher error your error rates are. The less subvocalization, the lower your error rates are. Um, now, as I say, this at first puzzled us a bit, but it's completely consistent with the literature on subvocalization during reading. When people are reading difficult passages, or if you take a poor reader, a relatively poor reader, you find more subvocalization. So in these contexts, subvocalization may be used to kind of prop up the uh, deficient phonological awareness of the reader. That might be going on here too. Uh, our poor pitch singers may have difficulty generating an auditory image, and so they try to engage in more muscle activity uh, to compensate. So to wrap up this particular section of the talk, um, the theme here is that the ability to match pitch while you're singing doesn't result from just one process working correctly. Minimally, I would say, three processes we've identified here. Pitch discrimination, motor system, uh, and sensory motor translation. Um, also, this is not something, it seems, that we're just 
given as a gift from our parents, although I'm sure that plays a part. It is, to some degree, a learned skill. But I have to end also with a caveat. So I've been drawing attention to the fact that even though we have significant results, none of the results I've shown you is accounting for, let's say, 90% of the variability in pitch accuracy. If you put them all together, we're at best accounting for maybe about half of the variability in pitch accuracy. So there's a lot more to understand that's out there uh, that, that, than what we're doing so far. But I think, uh, I think we've made some good steps forward. But let's now go to a kind of a bigger picture question, which is, what is all this worth? What is pitch accuracy for in the end? Uh, what role does it play? How much does it matter? Uh, right, so as I mentioned before, uh, pitch accuracy uh, is is a big deal in the general public. You know, people talk about singing out of tune, they talk about uh, bad singers, people, we laugh at people in American Idol. Uh, you know, I, I hate all this stuff, but it's part of our culture, um, and, and it's something to deal with. Uh, so, to what degree do we really care about these things? So, Stephen Brown and I um, kind of took on this issue of the aesthetic importance of mistuned singing. So, descriptively, inaccurate singing is often called singing that is out of tune. Well, there are a couple ways we can think about singing out of tune, uh, or, or think about the errors we make while we're singing. So, given a particular deviation in the pitch you sing, from the pitch you're trying to imitate, we can uh, decompose that deviation into two components. One, Steve and I call macro tuning, which has to do with whether um, the nearest pitch to the one you just sang is the correct pitch or if it's some other pitch. In other words, are you singing the wrong note? Is the closest note the wrong note to the one that, that you are um, trying to use? And so we can measure macro tuning in terms of the number of semitones that separate what you just sang from what you tried to sing. I would not say that macro tuning is really singing out of tune. All right? it, it measures what the closest pitch in the tuning system is to what you just sang. Micro tuning has to do with how close the pitch you just sang is to the nearest possible pitch in the tuning system. And so this, to me, is a more transparent measure of being out of tune, because that has to do with your match to the tuning system. Right? So we can decompose the errors people make into raw note versus out of tune. And so here's an example to make all this concrete. Let's say you have a deviation score of 120 cents. So the closest possible pitch in the tuning system is 100 cents away from what you were trying to see. So you have a macro tuning deviation of one semitone combined with this 20 cent deviation of what you sang to any pitch there. So we took a, a database of recordings of people singing the song Happy Birthday to You, uh, which is a good song for getting people to sing poorly. It's, it's one of these songs that's much harder to sing than what people think it is. Um, and, uh, and, and then gave a group of listeners, and these are just poi poi listeners, these, these are intro to psychology students from University of Texas San Antonio where I was teaching at the time, and they rated how good they thought the pitch was, right? So just the, the, the person on the street kind of analysis. So when we look at the relationship between these ratings and semitone deviations, this is macro tuning, we find a strong significant relationship, stronger than uh, many other relationships I've shown you today. So when people deviate by more semitones, we have a lower rating of accuracy and vice versa. How about micro tuning? This measure, which is to me more transparently a measure of singing in tune. No relationship. The listeners didn't care about that. And in fact, there are other data out there from Sean Hutchins saying that we, when we're listening to at least a cappella recordings, and that's what these were too, um, listeners tend to be quite generous in the kinds of uh, errors they allow, that you can be maybe even a hundred cents off and people won't hear your error. Um, when Stephen Demarest and I have looked at the relationship between our errors generated from acoustic recordings and expert listeners marking where they think the error is, there's a hugely strong correlation, but the human listeners are always more forgiving and rate fewer tones as being errors than what we get out of the acoustic uh, measures. So out of tune might not matter as much to the listener as one may think. Now, let's go on to address a related question 
about uh, the significance of what we call singing accuracy. And this ends up being a little bit of a self-criticism on how people like me are measuring pitch. So when I measure pitch, as I mentioned to you before, we typically take the note that someone sings, rip off the beginning and the ends, because that's where all the instability happens, find the central portion, and get, the, uh, get a measure of central tendency for that central portion. Well, is that what listeners do? Are listeners disregarding the beginnings and the ends? Or do they actually use the beginnings and the ends when they're evaluating performances? So the beginnings and the ends of the notes often have what we would call scoops. Uh, you know, so think about someone like Bing Crosby with a very exaggerated scoop at the beginning of his pitches. Pauline Leroy Maestri and I did a study, uh, which was a perception study, where we created synthesized melodies that had scoops up or down on the third note of the melody. Uh, along with changes in the central uh, tuning of that note also. And we gave listeners a pair comparison task where they listened to two versions of the melody and they chose which one they thought was, in this case, more in tune. And so we we're interested in the role that these scoops have on listener judgments. And what we found is, first off, that listeners do care about scoops. That the effect of these scoops on listener judgments goes beyond the way in which scoop might uh, influence the average tuning across the tone. They have an independent role. Secondly, there's a difference between scoops that are at the beginning versus the end of the tone. Our listeners are much more forgiving about scoops at the beginning than scoops at the end. As if the, the scoop at the beginning indicates that you're just getting there, and okay, we'll give you that. Whereas a scoop at the end means you can't stay there, and that's more of a problem. <laughs> the third thing, which was to us at least the most uh, interesting part, was you can, you can differentiate scoops in terms of whether they go against or counteract the overall melodic contour, or whether they're more continuous with this. So for instance, a melody like this, these are the scoops that we added, would uh, have scoops that preserve the continuity. So this would be so like da, 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 da. Listeners don't like this so much. They would prefer scoops that go like this. Da, 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 da. Uh, and we think that this effect also happens because listeners are making some assumptions about the singer, not just listening to the uh, acoustic property. So a singer who does this is heard as perhaps having a small vocal range, or having a little trouble getting there. Whereas a singer who does this is enhancing uh, the pitch differences and is exhibiting maybe a larger vocal range. So the bigger picture here has to do with pitch accuracy and aesthetics. How much does it matter? And even though I've devoted a good portion of my life studying pitch accuracy and singing, I'm here to tell you that you should be careful not to over-exaggerate its importance in the broader scheme of uh, music. Of course, there are a lot of ways to measure singing, and I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, argue that to the hill. So, is accuracy of pitch sufficient for musical enjoyment, right? Is, is that enough? Just, just have an accurate pitch? And I would say no. There are plenty of examples out there of accurate singers who we would not buy a record album from. And I have an example here from American Idol. So here's a poor chap who went on American Idol and was laughed off the stage, like so many were. And his name was William Hall. And he was singing that classic of all time, Ricky Martin's She Bangs. And here's a poor chap. Talk to me, tell me your side. You switching sides like a Gemini. You playing games and now you're hitting my heart like a try. Yeah, baby. So let's listen to Ricky Martin. Right? So there are a lot of differences between those recordings, but note that William Hung is absolutely nailing the pitches. Right? He's getting them right on, and he's doing that with one take and a cappella, which I bet Ricky Martin might not have done. Right? So he's very accurate, but again, he's not someone we'd go out and want to sing. Um, also, think about what optimal accuracy would be. We live in a world of auto tuning. How many here would like to convert all of the recordings you have at home into auto-tuned versions which are perfectly accurate? No. Probably nobody. We'd end up listening to a world of Mr. Roboto, right? The 80s song with the gimmicky uh, robot voice at the beginning. So we don't want that. So let's, let's, let's take a step further. Is accuracy necessary for musical enjoyment, right? Maybe it's not sufficient, but is it the minimum that you need? And I would also say the answer is no. Of course, there are out-of-tuned singers that are unlikable and lovable and, and we don't want to listen to them. So Lawrence Foster Jenkins is an example. This is a famous This is the this is the best part. Now, right, now, now admittedly that is a particularly evil 
bit of writing for a friend, but uh, <laughs> I just found out she's doing it well. Um, right, so we know five according to her, but consider, consider the, uh, this uh, other bit of evidence, right? Millions and millions of people have gone out and bought this album, Tommy, right? The, the, um, the dramatic peak of this rock opera is the See Me, Feel Me chorus. The whole thing is sung about a quarter tone flat, right? And people, millions upon millions of people have listened to and enjoyed that. And so, um, and then finally a point that, that backs up this is if you look at, and Pauline Leroy did this study, if you look at expert opera singers and have them sing in a plain, boring way, and then compare that to them singing in an expressive way, and measure their pitch accuracy, the pitch accuracy reliably goes down when they sing with expression. So a recording like this, that's a, the plain version, still nice sounding, but it's generally less accurate than And it's not just vibrato, so Pauline was very careful to rule out the role of vibrato there. But there's a lot of other things that go on there, including the use of scoops and the use of expressive intonation uh, that plays into expressive performances. So to, uh, to wrap things up, I want to do that so I can give a chance to the questions and comments people have. Uh, some take-home points uh, from what I was talking about today. So pitch accuracy, by which I mean the ability to match pitch with our voice, uh, I would argue is not a rare gift that it may be the dominant tendency in the general population. Uh, it can be measured acoustically, although you know, the acoustic measurements should be seen in perspective. Uh, the ability to match pitch in this way relies on a network of perceptual and motor and sensory motor functions, and that uh, any case that one might be dealing with of an individual has trouble singing accuracy should uh, take into account these various things. I think ultimately, uh, my, my kind of grand view of what this research might contribute to music education is we might ultimately be able to understand different difficulties people learning to sing might have with respect to these different parts of the, of the, of the sensory motor loop. And finally, I think pitch accuracy is an incredibly interesting function. And from the standpoint of a cognitive psychologist, as I said before, I think it's a, it's a really incredible form of imitation that we can do. Uh, it plays an important role, not just in, in music, but also in language learning, too. And it's very important to understand it. It is very important for music, but it's not the only thing. And we should not over-exaggerate the importance of, uh, of pitch accuracy, I think, as uh, as educators, as friends, as so on like that, because I think it's good. The more of us who sing, the happier and healthier uh, culture I think we will be. And I think we've got a really kind of self-critical, uh, you know, self-deprecating spirit when it comes to singing in our population. And it'd be really good to, to get away from that. Um, and so uh, I'd like to say some thank yous as I wrap things up. So I, I've worked with a lot of great people over the years. Uh, a couple of people actually didn't quite make it into the final version of the talk. I'll say thank you to them anyway. Uh, we got funding from some great sources, and, and that's really nice. The NSF just smiled on us again, so we'll be able to do more with their help. But most important, uh, thanks to all of you for taking so much time to listen to me gab on here, and uh, I thank you for your attention. singing a song, and sometimes they're on pitch, sometimes they're pitchy, that is off pitch a little bit. Mm -hmm. What is your orientation to to that kind of not being on pitch? Yeah. You end up like a panel like a panel on it. Yeah, so that's, that's, in the, that's in the kind of, you know, the, the zone of more subtlety. So that actually, before I answer your question, I do want to remark on something that um, I was wanting to make more explicit than I did. Right. So the way we're defining being accurate or inaccurate, 
is not the same thing as saying that someone sounds good or not good, right? So there's a fairly wide range of wiggle room in plus or minus 50 cents. So someone who is pitchy would almost certainly be classified as accurate here. Um, I think pitchiness is important. I think micro-tuning would identify the pitchiness. I think some listeners would care, some listeners wouldn't, and I think the person who is exhibiting pitchiness probably has a different kind of deficit than someone who is what we would call a poor pitch singer. Another thing that I forgot to mention too that your question is reminding me of is um, one thing I should note about these studies is we tend to look at acapella singing. And right, so the sensitivity to being out of tune is, is going to be higher if you're singing with a company. Um, a couple of questions maybe elaborate a little bit about the one that Mark uh -huh. asked, which is you have a four note sequence, right? Yes. Do you look at a lot of times people will be accurate on the first note and the last note and it's the middle notes sometimes that, that suffer. Yeah. Do you look at Yeah, we haven't looked at that. In general we found with our little four note sequences that actually the the first note tends to be the least accurate, and they get a bit better as they go through, like the kind of like what we saw there. So we don't get because what you're referring to is a kind of like the serial position effect with memory, and I think we get that if we got longer sequences. One thing we found with these short imitation of, of, of unfamiliar melodies is that the the short-term memory capacity for these melodies is really limited. Right? We've tried to give people five note melodies, and it's a mess. Just giving them that fifth note, right? And so it's really an, an eye opening sort of thing that way. Varies with musical experience. It probably does, right? So um, although I don't remember, let's see. Yeah, I don't know if we've done the analysis of looking at how many people have those breakdowns by musical experience. But I suspect it would. I mean, people with musical experience do have larger pitch stands than people without. And one of the questions. Sure. Are you also administering the Amusia battery to the people that you're getting in your database so you can distinguish people who have truly diagnosed Amusia? Yeah, we, we have it in general, but that study I showed you was the was the was the first step there. We might start doing it. Uh, one tricky thing is, you know, when you're doing individual difference uh, measures, uh, your uh, the number of measures you're administering to someone before you get them in your experiment and really mushroom. Yeah. And the Amusia battery, even the, on the online version, yeah, the online version takes you to 20 minutes, but you actually can't call someone a music from the online version. You're supposed to bring them back for the hour and a half long full test after that. So it becomes a little hard. No, but I think, I, I, you know, given how strong that relationship is, I think going in that direction probably would be good. Yeah, thanks. So I think you alluded to this during the presentation, but it, I would love your opinion on this. I have great singers, some that have won Grammys. Leon Bridges, one of them, he can sing. Uh, he can sing the songs he's written, mm -hmm. he can sing songs even if we learn them, but scales can't even match the pitch. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference in being able to sing a song? Is it just a sensory memory or is it in fact... Yeah. Now go back, I couldn't quite hear at the beginning of who this individual is. So it's, he's a, he's a, he just won a Grammy this year and he's, oh. a, he's an amazing singer. Okay. But he can't do scales. He can't do exercises. I have to go one note at a time and then sing it in his ear. Yeah. But yet when he sings, when he sings a song, right on. Yeah. Except he does all the you see this kind of style. You see this kind of thing in chi child singers. We have um, a child too. Yeah. yeah, because uh, so for for children, everything's a song. Like you give you give a kid an, an individual note, they don't know what to do with it. You you give a kid a do 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 sequence, they don't know what to do with it. You know, everything for a child is a song, so it's the gestalt that's really important for them. And uh, scales become gestalts for most of us who've taken music lessons for a long time, but it's not quite the same as binding together the music with the words and song like that. So that's what I would be guessing is happening for this individual here. But but um, it happens frequently. Yeah. So there's something about binding, as you said, words to the perception of that song yeah. to the actual frequencies. Yes. And I don't know what that is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, imag I imagine that it, it, this person really has, yeah, I, mean, I don't know if I can shed yeah. more light than that, but I, that, that sounds really interesting. That sounds like a very interesting case. By the way, Isab so Isabel Bretz and I studied, this never has actually gotten published for various reasons, but we found someone with the opposite issue, right? So there was a case that she discovered many years ago uh, of someone who is a, a music education graduate student with absolute pitch, um, but as soon as he sang with lyrics, it was all over the place. He could only sing everything on fixed dough, and then it, so it's, it's almost the opposite of what you're talking about. So I think what you have is a flip side. Okay. 
Hi, this was a great presentation. Oh, Very entertaining. Uh, two questions. The first one. Tommy, really? <laughs> I think that half of us are going to go to our rooms and just Spotify Tommy again. Is it really out of tune? Is he, out of yeah, the CD me feel course. I'll tell you, go back and listen. That, that part of it, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> My question is, uh, you, you talked about this self-deprecating thing that you find quite right. often. Uh, and even though it's not directly related to your research, do you think that this is a cultural phenomenon, particularly in this country or maybe more uh, European countries where the relationship to music and singing may be different from some African cultures where singing is not about the beauty of it, but just the expression and the joy? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think musical, the, the sense of musical elitism is really at a peak in, um, in our current culture. I think it might even be worse in North America than it is in Europe and, and in England, where they have the kind of group, much more group singing in pubs and football games and stuff like that. But certainly, in, in um, now I'm not an ethnomusicologist, but I've read around in this area a little bit. Where um, if you go to, for instance, more traditional um, groups of people in Africa, the idea of just not being a musician is not a concept. That it, it's something that everybody does because group is all because music is always a group activity. And for our culture, music is something that you observe someone else doing quite often. And I think it's gotten worse since we've had uh, so many more studio recordings that are doctored. Um, and so we have this idea of what people should sound like, which I think has gotten way out of it. Uh, your uh, entire presentation was uh, framed around pitch, mm -hmm. and yet your measurements of accuracy are made on fundamental frequency. Yes, yes. Uh, is it possible that somebody is 50 cents off on fundamental frequency, but makes up for it on timbre? Because if you know that pitch is much determined on the timbre of the sound, and so they may still be pitch-wise accurate, even though they're wrong on fundamental frequency. Yeah. Yeah, it might happen. So, so the, the one way that we've addressed that is by having um, these expert listeners also rate the recordings and how many errors they are, and there's a very close correspondence. But as I mentioned before, the, uh, the expert raters are a little bit more forgiving, so we could do more with that. So what would you suggest as a next measure, a kind of a method of adjustment study on uh, the pitches people are singing, or...? That, that would help. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, I was missed the very beginning, and I wanted to know, did you use different vowels for these tests? Uh -huh. All different random vowels, there was no... No, no, all the same vowel. You, you, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. you said that would be E, right. Okay. Do, do, do. Do, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, is there any uh, uh, registration that was asked to be used when you did this ooh, or they just did whatever ooh, which is a ooh, like, yeah. did, did, was there like a, a, me, a, a mode one or a mode two uh -huh. for a while when you ask these people to do it? In other words, what I'm saying is, is that pitch accuracy, if it's mapped in a certain, in the body, in a certain way, people refer in the body to the pitch that they audiate, mm -hmm. right? They're likely to be accurate if they hear the pitch first. Mm -hmm. Were they, were the, you know, do you, I guess my question is, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if, like what Ingo just said, if the registration and the formats had anything to do with their mm -hmm. accuracy. So there was a lot of consistency in the, in the formats that people imitated because they all imitated these pre-recorded recordings of people singing do, right? Um, and so there was that. And is, is, is that kind of addressed what you're asking? Well, or? Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to figure out like the skill. Uh, it just it was never mind. <laughs> I, there's actually one other thing I say that that, that that relates to the in, the general issue of formants and so on like that. Um, in the SAP, there's a there's a there's a vocal pitch matching and a and a piano pitch matching task mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. And um, people do worse in the piano pitch matching, particularly those who are poor overall. There's a big de decrement there. So they are definitely using tangible information to help them imitate. Okay, so like with happy birthday, the first two notes of happy birthday are the same note, right? So if yes. a person understands it with E, 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 they're likely to, like, if they understand it's the same note. If they go, happy, right, then it goes flat. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to figure out Never mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, with auto tune, they don't auto tune everything perfectly anymore. They detune oh, okay. things to make it sound more natural. Make it sound more human. All right. Thank you.
Peter, out of time.